Now, moving forward this morning, I do want to say that, um, how many, you know, there's been a lot happening in the news this, uh, this, this week. If you haven't been watching, maybe you're living under a rock. Maybe you're still working with stone tablets. I don't know. But uh, we had an election this, this week. And for many people, this is a, course of, a cause of celebration. And for many people, this is a time of, of, of lament and uneasiness and uncertainty. And I want to say that you're in, if, if either one of those describes you, you're in good company this morning because someone to your left or to your right is probably feeling one of those ways, <laughs> right? And I've received several emails, I've received several phone calls uh, this week about people on both sides of that spectrum. And I have a couple of thoughts in light of that uh, while we're celebrating our veterans today and, and acknowledging that we're in a new place as a country uh, this week. That Here's a gospel, a biblical truth for you. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is an unchanging God in the way he watches over us and the way he extends his love and mercy to us. God is the same today, yesterday, and forever, even in an ever-changing set of circumstances. Do you believe that? Okay. Point A. Point B. Here's what I think. The kingdom of God is never in trouble. (laughs) Okay? The kingdom of God is never in trouble, wherever you may find yourself in the midst of this uh, this morning. You know, back in the day, it was a radical statement to say that Jesus is Lord. It was an absolutely radical statement. In fact, it was a very politically charged statement to say that Jesus is Lord. What we have to remember is that the first 300 years of, of, after the resurrection, Christianity was illegal. And you remember when Jesus was on trial for his life and Pilate asked the Pharisees, shall I crucify your king? And the Pharisees reply, what? We have no king but Caesar. And in that statement, they, they, they betrayed their own God, Yahweh, by declaring uh, that statement. And Jesus went on to say in his life, you know, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. I don't give like the world gives, so let not your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The, the story of the gospel is that Christ is victorious. And Christ has said so in his life, death, and resurrection. So if you're one of those people who are really uneasy, uh, it's not just my beard that's scaring the children this week. Uh, it's some of the reactions that we're seeing going on on social media and going on in our conversations with each other. So I want you to remain calm. <laughs> remain calm. And furthermore, Jesus reminds us to pray for our leaders and to pray for our enemies and to remember that, you know what, at the end of the day, we're all in this together and and love wins, right? So let's breathe in the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning and breathe out that which is burdening you. Breathe in the presence of God which is in this place again. And I invite you to let go that which is distracting you from entering in fully into God's presence today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, most gracious God, it is a good day to have a good day. And it is always the right time to do the right thing, which is to give you praise, honor, and glory. Lord, we thank you that you are an ever-present God, that you hold us in the palm of your hand, and that your love will never let us go. And in this time, these sacred moments ahead, as I expound upon your written word, Lord, I pray that your one true word, the Logos, Jesus Christ, would be revealed in this place. That by the power of your Holy Spirit, his statutes and his conditions for our living and our believing would transform our lives and give us hope today, tomorrow, and forever. For you are the same. You are love yesterday, today, and forever. And that love wins. We declare that in this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So friends, if you're visiting with us this morning, I just want to take a second and update you a little bit as to to where we're at. You heard the the scripture read this morning from Luke chapter 15. And this passage is oftentimes, you know, if you open your Bible and you look at at the heading, a lot of times the Bible is broken up into into different uh, sections and it's, it's got heading titles on it. And oftentimes what we most see is the story of the prodigal son. And what we've been discovering the last few weeks, that prodigal 
The word prodigal means to be spendthrift. It means to be darn near irresponsible and just lavish with whatever you're attributing that term with. And we talked a lot about the story of the younger son last week, how he went to his father, wanted his inheritance, went off and hired himself out as a pig farmer after losing all of his, his wealth that the father gave him. And you could say that that son was prodigal in the way that he went about that, right? That he, he spent his wealth on what the Bible called frivolous living, now, we don't know exactly what that entailed, other than at the end of the story, the elder brother stipulated that part of his wealth was spent on prostitutes. So if that's the kind of clientele you're surrounding yourself with, you can imagine the rest of what that frivolous living may have been. We don't know for sure. But we could certainly say that the younger son was prodigal in the way that he went wayward and spent his wealth. And we also talked about how the, the, the younger son, the prodigal son that we oftentimes refer to, came back. He had this moment of repentance down in the midst of the pig slop when he had reached his rock bottom and thought that he would come back and hire himself out to be a hired hand to his father. And what happens is when he comes back, the father doesn't wait for him. He sees him off in the distance. He picks up his robe and runs to his younger son to welcome him home. He puts the family robe around him, puts the family ring on his finger and grants him sonship grants it to him without earning it and without merit. And, of course, we've been culminating up to this point that perhaps this parable is mistitled, the prodigal son, that perhaps this parable would be mostly appropriately titled the story of the prodigal father, a father that lavishes love on each of us. Whether we're Manny, <laughs> whether we're Chase, the Father's love is seriously ridiculous. <laughs> it's just seriously ridiculous. And we also know that for many of us, we find kind of our salvation story in the reading of the story of the younger son. Many of us f acknowledge that as the story of, of sin and going wayward and being estranged from the Father and, and God's prevenient grace, which is always pursuing us, which is always chasing us, encounters us at some point. We have this transforming experience where we say yes to Jesus because he has said yes to us first, granting us, calling us sons and daughters of, of the kingdom. We love to talk about the story of the younger son and the love of the Father, but if we look at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, which should be coming up on screen here in just a moment, the context of the parable is in the midst of the Pharisees grumbling about the company that Jesus keeps. This is so important. I want you to remember this, that Jesus is telling this story in, in a, as a reaction to something that has happened. And you'll see this is the first part of Luke chapter 15. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they what? Muttered. Muttered. This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. So this is the context in which Jesus is telling this story. Jesus goes on to tell a parable about the lost sheep. The lost sheep. Then he goes on to tell a parable about the lost coin. And then we find ourselves in the midst of this story this morning, the story of the prodigal son. And what we've talked about is that the, the, the personalities of these two brothers, the one son who went wayward, who did nothing of the will of the father and was still extended the father's love, and the older son who was obedient to a fault, still wanting nothing of the relationship with the father, still wanting the father's stuff by doing all the right things, but without the relationship, we both know, we know that these two sons in this parable, we're supposed to be reading them parallel with each other and holding them in tension with one another. Because this what, this, what Jesus is doing is he's telling the story of salvation. Salvation is God's mighty and saving acts. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. None shall come to the Father except through me. Ultimately, Jesus says, those who have seen me have seen the Father. Jesus is telling the story of the Father's radical, prodigal love. 
that is extended to the least and the lost, to the sinners and the tax collectors, and even to the Pharisees themselves. You know, it is the story of salvation. Last week, we talked a little bit about how many of us think that we have to have this younger son experience. That we, 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 we look back, and for some of us, we can say, oh my gosh, I can name the time, date, and place where I said yes to Jesus, and sonship or daughtership was, was granted to me. For me, it was July in 2004 out in uh, Orange County, California. I remember this. It was, it was one of those... Big, booming spiritual experiences that transform my life. And we said some of us have those kind of experiences, right? But others of us, we don't come to faith that way at all. We may look back and we say, you know, I've never really had one of those big, boom, earth-shattering experiences. Am I, have I been granted sonship? Am I truly a daughter of Christ? And we likened it to the to, the, to, a, to a window shade. Some of us, God tugs on that shade and the, the shade goes up really quick and, and the grace of God, that, 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 that light just radiates in and it's this earth-shattering experience. But I think for many of us, I would even say many times most of us, God has been turning that shade gradually throughout the course of our life. And that grace, that, that light has always been radiating. And perhaps we can't name the time, date, and place. But if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, put your whole trust in his grace and want to live in love for him and to love your neighbor, y'all need to relax. You've been granted sonship. <laughs> you, you're, you're a daughter of the most high God. You know, I say all the time, I was saved once, but not all at once. <laughs> You know, I'm still a work in progress. You can ask my wife, or don't. <laughs> I'm still under spiritual construction. It's God is continually sanctifying and saving me every day as I'm trusting he's doing with all of you as well. So we get to the, this story. We, we read it, and so oftentimes because we sentimentalize the story of the younger son, we, we get these, these warm fuzzies when we, we read this story. It tugs at our emotions, doesn't it? I know it does for mine, because I find many ways I find my story in this telling of, of, the, of the younger son. But Jesus is telling this parable as a reaction to something that has happened. To the grumbling about the company that he is keeping. And we said that oftentimes that once many of us who have that younger son experience, that we can be prideful in the fact that we've said yes to Jesus. And we can become worker bees for the gospel because we're so excited about our faith. But then, oftentimes, it turns into stuff. It turns into doing stuff for the sake of the gospel. And, and oftentimes, we put doing stuff and doing good works above the relationship of the Father. You understand that you can be wayward in your rebellion, and you can be wayward in your obedience. You following me? You track him, okay? So we get to the story of the older son today. Luke chapter 15, verse 28. The, we told this story last week. The, the younger son has come back. The father has received him. And the older son who has been obedient to his father his entire life, the older brother became angry and he refused to go in, refused to go in to the party that was being thrown. So his father went out. His father leaves the party and pleads with him, which would have been an incredible shameful thing for the father to do once again. Incredibly shameful for the father to grant a third of his, and a third of his estate to the younger son. Incredibly shameful for the father to leave this party that the entire village, the entire town would have been invited to, to go out and, le and meet this younger son. This prodigal father leaves the party. And here's what we need to know, that the oldest son would get a of the sold off. In the act of the younger son coming. Do you know what that means? 
what that You see why he is And you don't even kill, uh, you haven't even killed a small goat for me, he says. Where's mine? The younger son at the beginning says, give me mine. The older son at the end said, but not the relationship. And in his bitterness, the older son harbors unforgiveness for his brother. There was a few years back in my in my in my ministry in Marengo. I was in my office, and it was the middle of the afternoon. I was there all by myself, and uh, a young gal, probably in her thirties, walks into my office and says, "Are you the pastor?" I said, yeah. She's like, well, you don't look like one of those. (laughs) I said, thank you. (laughs) She says, I I need to talk to someone. Do you have a minute? I said, of course I do. Why don't you sit down? And she began to tell me this story, how she is 30 years old, and she has carried around unforgiveness and hatred for her father. And not for terrible reasons. Her father began assaulting her, at the age of eight years old, and continued to do so almost daily until she was 17 years old, until she left her home. And she said, I, I can't get past this. I, I've, gone to, I've gone to therapy. I've, 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 I've done everything that I, I can think of. In fact, I didn't sleep a wink last night. And I I, it was just kind of one of those grace things. I, I'm not, you know, I always tell people my education far exceeds my intelligence. <laughs> it was kind of one of those grace moments where I felt the Spirit of God come on to me. And I said, how long has this man taken you hostage? She says, over half my life. I said, yeah. Do you think he's lo- he lost any sleep last night? She says, I imagine he probably didn't. I said, perhaps forgiveness is not so much about letting the other person off the hook, but about, about allowing yourself to claim freedom again. Think about that. Perhaps forgiveness is not so much about letting the other person off the hook, but about letting yourself have your life back again. I've talked, it's, it's the theme of the Bible, an, a disobedient people that receives forgiveness and reconciliation from the Father, an image in which we are created, a, a, a grace and a forgiveness that we are called to extend ourselves. And that sounds great on paper. I mean, that preaches really well. But when you get in the mess of living, that's not so easy, is it? Perhaps forgiveness isn't so much about letting the other person off the hook, but about claiming your life back. Again, how many hours, how many relationships have suffered in your life because you've allowed someone else to take you hostage? I ask you. We got to the end of this conversation, and she had this incredible realization. She said, oh my gosh, Pastor Matt, what if when I die and I go to heaven and that, I won't tell you what she called him, And that guy is there. And I said, wow. Couldn't that be a celebration? A celebration 
What are you, how could this possibly be a celebration? I said, if he is there, he would have truly recognized the harm that he had caused you. And he would have truly repented for that. And what an opportunity for you to begin a relationship with your dad that you never, ever had. She said, hmm, got up and left my office. I received a letter from her last year. This was three, four years ago. She wrote me a letter. I didn't even remember her name until she started telling the story again. And then I was like, oh my gosh, we have met. I know exactly who this is. And at the end of the letter, she says, I've been able to lay that burden down at the feet of Jesus. And I have never known what it's like to have a free life until that moment. How many days, how many hours, how many wasted minutes do we carry in unforgiveness for others? What we see in the story of the rebellion of the younger son and the story of the obedience of the elder son, the father says to the older son, he says, all I have is yours. Come in. They're both ultimately invited to the same party. And the, the, the amazing thing about this story is that it leaves us as a complete cliffhanger. The parable never resolves itself. We don't know what the older brother actually does. Read it all the way to the end. It never says if he comes in or if he comes out. And you remember Jesus is telling this parable to the Pharisees. To the one, to the church, to the ones on the inside, to the ones on the no, to the ones who sit in judgment to others. And it leaves the parable open as a challenge and as a possibility. And we never see the full benefits of the joy that God has to offer in this life. I ask you, who in your life are you harboring unforgiveness for? Who has taken you hostage in your life? We're all invited to the, to the same party. I, it's hard for me to talk about this story without getting emotional about it. Because the story of the prodigal son is the story of my life. I led a very rebellious teenage years. In fact, there came a point, my parents are sitting in the front row. I'm, remember, I have the microphone. You're not allowed to testify to any of this this morning. Make them feel welcomed after church, but don't believe anything they say. Okay? <laughs> but I led a very rebellious teenage years. And I had an older sister named Lindsay. And I had an older sister, even older than Lindsay, named Michelle, who was special needs. And my younger brother was special needs. And I was ADD and incredibly rebellious. And Lindsay was the glue that held it all together. <laughs> and she was always at the right place. Always right on time. Always doing the right thing. And there came a point where we had a conversation. Matt, you need to turn from your waywardness or you simply have to go. And I said, peace out. And I left. And I couch hopped for about a month. I, I went from friend to friend and used up that relationship and those resources until that dried out. And then I hopped to the next couch and the next relationship. And it wasn't long until I had hit my own rock bottom and the pig slop looked tempting. That I came to my own moment of repentance and came back. And I remember my father on the front porch as I'm walking up the driveway with its arms open waiting for me to come home. And my sister, Lindsay, becomes indignant at this point. I've always been in the right place, doing the right thing, at the right time, and you bring him back in. My sister and I didn't talk for almost five or six years. And it wasn't until 2009, sitting in a restaurant together, where I finally called her and said, let's get together, that we hashed it out, man. I mean, we cleared that place out. They, they probably should have called security. 
It got loud. It got verbally violent. And yet we needed that sacred space to air that to one another. And we were able to reconcile. I'm excited. I get to, to host Thanksgiving dinner this year. And Lindsay and her family will be coming. We're all invited to the same party. <laughs> Who are you harboring unforgiveness for? Who have you allowed to take hostage, to take you hostage in your own life? And are you willing to not necessarily let them off the hook, but allow yourself in Christ to claim the freedom and the joy in which he has promised you to reclaim your life again? It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen.